Hello, everyone. I am Tracy Heider Suffern, and it is my great pleasure to serve as the Executive Director of the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. It's also my very great pleasure to introduce to each of you our new four-part Harlem Renaissance series. Our special guest, our very special guest for this series is Dr. Robert G. O'Mealy, the Zora Neale Hurston Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. Dr. O'Mealy is also the founder of Columbia's Center for Jazz Studies, which he led for many years. He's, he's authored and edited numerous books on jazz and black culture, including, but certainly not limited to, Lady Day, The Many Faces of Billie Holiday, Romare Bearden, A Black Odyssey, The Jazz Cadence of American Culture. As one of the world's foremost thinkers, he has researched and written about the early influence of jazz, 20th century black genius, political thinking, the arts, black expression, and rendering each of these topics exciting and digestible for the rest of us. We experience Bob O'Mealy here in conversation with National Jazz Museum in Harlem senior scholar Lauren Schoenberg. Thank you so much for joining us. Along with our artistic directors, Christian McBride and John Batiste, I hope you'll go to the museum's event page to click on the many other expanded online and educational cultural programs we have to offer. Please visit us at jazzmuseuminharlem.org. Once again, that's jazzmuseuminharlem.org. And in the meantime, I know that you will enjoy this series as much as I and the rest of us will. Have fun. I am so happy and honored uh, to be talking to my great friend, Bob O'Mealy, about the Harlem Renaissance. Bob, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, you know, for taking time out and uh, talking to us about this. Well, it's a, the, pl the pleasure is entirely mine. It's, it does my heart good just to see your face and to think about our listeners out there. Yeah. And uh, I know that this is, you know, uh, as we covered when we talked about uh, who you are and why you're here, you know, obviously this is uh, uh, a subject of, of, of a lifetime's worth of study. Uh, I think you told me last time we spoke that actually we just finished teaching a course on it, which I guess you've been doing on and off for years and years. So we'll be the beneficiaries of that fact. But this is going to be a very general conversation because, frankly, I have a lot to learn, too. And so I'm just going to pose some questions and we'll go from there. Uh, this will be three parts. The second and third part will be kind of looking through the focus or uh, focusing on Zora Neale Hurston in a way and Langston Hughes in a way as they take us into uh, into various things of how they dealt with jazz and all that. But this first conversation will be much, much more general, uh, much more general. And I'd like to start just uh, with a basic question, which is uh, so many times at the Jazz Museum, uh, people come in and they want to talk about the Harlem Renaissance, and they assume that all the great things that happened in jazz in the 20s in Harlem, uh, were part of the Renaissance. Now, it's my understanding that at the time, there were really kind of two separate spheres. Uh, can you talk about when people just shove everything that happened in black music in the 20s into the larger context of the Harlem Renaissance? Is that right, wrong, or a combination of both? Well, it's, it's a great question, and it's not an easy question. Uh, I, I don't hear you anymore. Let me, maybe, shall I tell you? Here I am. Oh, I see. You muted yourself as I was talking. I'm sorry. Is that so? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, it's kind of funny. I've learned how to mute myself. Unfortunately, a bunch of my friends have now asked me that when we get back together in person, if I can bring the mic. <laughs> <laughs> click. We had to right. That. Okay. Well, the, the question of, of uh, the Harlem Renaissance and its, its scope is a very good question. Someone told me at the Schomburg that it is still true that three-fourths of the people coming into the research room to do book reports or special things of that sort will come in and they'll say the words Harlem Renaissance and they'll say the words Martin Luther King and Malcolm X over and over and over again. And they think they might know what the Harlem Renaissance is, but then again, they, they, they're, they're not too sure about it. And it, it does seem to me that, that Langston Hughes was right, the, the great poet and novelist, uh, of the period was was right when he said 
the average person on the street, even in Harlem, would not have known what you meant by the phrase Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. If you said New Negro Renaissance, they might have a huh for that one too. They, they didn't know about it in those terms. Uh, but what I've been able to gather is that people had a sensation after the war and after certain things had come up on Broadway and after they'd seen Jack Johnson's picture on the wall, the heavyweight champion of the world, they had a, a sense that something new was in the air. And what excites me is that there were those who were very much the cognoscenti or the people who were at the cutting edge and making it happen like W.E.B. Du Bois and Langston Hughes and Augusta Savage and others. But then there were, uh, and of course the musicians, John, James P. Johnson and Willie the Lion and 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 Sidney Poitier, Poitier <laughs> Sydney, Bechet and others. But then again, what fascinates me is people, is the person like my, my, my aunt in Washington, D.C., who never became a known quantity of so at all. She was a school teacher. But she had a sense mm -hmm. that she had a special sense of responsibility now to her youngsters of the 1930s when she began to show them that this was a new world that it was not the world of frederick Douglass and booker t washington and it was not the world of williams and walker the dance uh, a team uh, the, of the turn of the century and that instead uh there, there would be a new quality of leadership across the boards and whether you were in the country uh, or, or the city, whether you were in the city of New York and in, in the, the, the village of Harlem, or whether you were in, in Brooklyn or the Bronx mm -hmm. or rural South Carolina, mm -hmm. you could feel something going on. You and I know Albert Murray uh, from, knew the great man from yes. outside Mobile, Alabama. And he says that when he was a, a student in the 1920s in semi-rural uh, uh, Alabama, his teacher said, you know, this, you have a responsibility to be ready for a new century and to take leadership across the board. And that's the Harlem Renaissance in the big sense that I mean, it, it, it struck the, the people who were writing and trying to make new arts, but it put a sense of uh, purpose, a strengthening of the backbone in people across the nation. One thing that I'm curious about at the get go here is that a hundred years after the Harlem Renaissance, or when it kind of began, are there any comparisons to be made? I mean, in terms of this bootstrapping up or this this sense that this is the time, it's different now. I mean, we're talking right now in early June 2020, yes. when things uh, are at a very uh, significant point in American history. And I'm wondering if there are any comparisons to be made uh, from what they're experiencing, thinking about their time and, and what we think about what's happening in our time? Well, I, I think there certainly are comparisons to be made between 1920 and, 19, and 2020. Uh, 1919 was called Red Summer because of riots all over the nation. Uh, Josephine Baker uh, left uh, East St. Louis uh, with with her, her hometown on fire, with the with the riots, and there were riots in my hometown of Washington D.C. as well, uh, sparked among other things by the return from World War One of soldiers who found themselves black soldiers hoping for a new world to return to after serving their country overseas came back and found themselves segregated again, and that and as they got smart with people, in other words, said, you know, hey, I'm a soldier, I'm not going to be called a boy anymore. Riots were, were, were sparked. And so that this, this juncture of a sense of responsibility in the arts and the sciences and the humanities was also part of a, of a movement that was explicitly political then as our movement is explicitly political now. The other thing I would say about that is that I think it's very difficult to find a single moment when the Harlem Renaissance begins. We like to say the 20s because that makes it a decade by decade 
thing, and that's that's 1920. Uh, 1917 is is the is the the date. Well, uh, that's uh, I'm sorry. 1919 is the date that some people pick. Uh, uh, Hughes picked 1921 because of the show Shuffle Along, but I think it's wise, mm-hmm. Lauren, to remember that the European Renaissance lasted over a period of centuries. Yeah. It's the fifth, late 15th century. Yes. Blossom into the 16th and 17th centuries all over Western Europe and stretching beyond Western Europe. And I think it's wise to think of the end of slavery and the, sh- the end of the shocks of the disappointments that went with the end of Reconstruction. In other words, the, the, the 19th century as a time when people like Henry Tanner and Scott Joplin in music, Tanner in art, mm-hmm. and, and, and people like Charles Chestnut in literature were creating the first stirrings that there was got there had got to be a, a rebirth, a renaissance, a, a, a new beginning. And likewise, I think that we need not end in 1929, as some people do, or 1930, and, or renaissance is only five or 10 years. But I, I think there's a sense in which into the 30s, when Hughes does his best work, and when Hurston does her best work, the 40s and 50s, when Du Bois is still writing, uh, I, I think it's wise to stretch it beyond those usual limits. And even to, to wonder now if we're not getting a second win of something began at, begun at that early period. Yeah. Well, th- that uh, I have a quote here from Emily Bernard uh, that she wrote in that uh, introduction to the letters of Van Vecht and, and Langston Hughes, and, and you already took us there. Uh, but just to expand upon it, uh, uh, you know, is it fair to call the Renaissance just from the 20s, or is it another, and this is precisely what you were saying, just taking it back even further, uh, is it another stage in the evolution of Black American art that began in the 1700s? Uh, and and just looking at it largely writ, and in fact, maybe it almost does it a disservice uh, to the folks that came before and the folks that came after to codify it. That's something just flamed up. Now, you, you mentioned... Um, uh, your hometown of Washington, and I'm wondering: are there, are there, were there equally significant things happening? And if we are going to just focus pretty much on the decade of the 20s, with understanding yes. that it's much broader than that, Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, Washington, uh, are there any folks that that we should know about, or that are not usually? Uh, blended into the conversation of County Cullen and and uh, Aaron Davis and all the rest, uh, who deserve mention, or who were uh, who we might not know about. Let me approach that question through through the comment you were making as you were as you were raising the question, uh, quoting Emily on on the uh, on Ben Beckton and the 1700s. I, I, I love, I've fallen in love with the philosopher Edouard Glissant uh, the, the, from Martinique. And he says, there's a moment when the slave says no. The former slave, the African, says, I'm not going to do that. I'm running away. I am breaking up my tools. I am going off into the woods and pray with my family. But when there's a spirit that refuses to be locked in this role, And he says that the process of stepping out and saying, I'm not just a slave, I'm a Christian. I'm not just a slave, I'm a jockey. I'm not just a slave and a jockey, I play the violin. I may be caught in this role, but I've got a lot more than that to say. I like that idea that you multiply, that the Renaissance is is fomented or sparked by this insistence that you're gonna multiply your sense of self, that you're gonna be more than anybody ever imagined you to be. And I think that process is supercharged uh, a, a, again and again, as, as Emily says, 17th, 18th, 19th, into the 20th century. And by the 1920s, you've got a rocket in, un, underneath people as they're determined to, to move beyond this country, beyond categories, beyond the languages that they grew up speaking. And so that you've got a, a, a Lane Locke becoming a Rhodes Scholar and studying in Oxford, and mm-hmm. Harvard to Oxford and back to Howard philosopher and many other things. And I, I, I like th- that idea that, that Hurston is, is from a very small town in Florida, Sora Hurston, uh, 
And then she multiplies, she becomes a scientist and a novelist, and, and, and she's, she's a, a collector of tales and all of that. Um, and when, you, when it comes to where the Renaissance occurred, uh, I, I, I love to start in Washington. I taught at Howard for several years. I don't know if you yeah. knew that. My first job was at Howard. I was proud to go back home and teach at the school. This was going from, from Stanford? That's right. Well, no, I, was, I went from DC public schools to Stanford to the shock to discover that uh, that kind of a setting and then back east to Harvard for graduate study and then down to DC for my first real job. And um, my senior professor there was Sterling Brown, the great man. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a chance to get to know him in a way that an 85 year old man is, 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 got, is gotten to know by a 25 year old, 26 year old. And one time I asked, I said, Professor Brown, you were part of the Harlem Renaissance. What can you tell me about it that I don't know already? And he said, well, that would take all day, son. I think it would take several days. But Harlem Renaissance, I can tell you this, I never could make that team. I, I, I didn't even dare try out for it. And I said, I can't imagine what you mean. He said, well, the Brins, man. The Harlem Renaissance was a team that played in the Harlem, uh, in, in the, the, the Renaissance ballroom in Harlem. That's the only Harlem Renaissance I knew anything about. And so Sterling was a joker, and, and, mm -hmm. and you could always learn something uh, folded between his jokes. But what, what he meant was that uh, there were events going on everywhere, changes in sports as well as in the arts. And then he talked about the Harlem Globetrotters, and he talked about teams in DC, and then he finally settled down to talk about Gene Toomer, uh, the, the great mm -hmm. novelist that he'd gone to Dunbar High School with when it was called M Street School. And uh, Georgia Douglas Johnson and her circle of writers in Washington that took in uh, Toomer and others and formed the kind of writer circle that Quincy Troop has around the corner from where we're sitting now, gathering writers and helping them to, to hear one another and to, and to improve uh, what they were doing. So I like to think of at, that way you get more women into the story. Once you ask yourselves, yes. where are these salons? Mm -hmm. And you have Lily uh, uh, Walker, uh, uh, Miss, Miss, Miss uh, CJ, Madam CJ Walker, exactly Walker. right. And the Dark Tower, as she called her place in, in Harlem, gathering people and encouraging them. And there were settings like that all over the place. And, uh, and, and I think if we remember, as I say that here, Hurston is from DC, is, is uh, from Eatonville, Florida, mm -hmm. and then goes to school in Baltimore and DC before she heads up to Harlem. And Hughes is from Kansas and lives for a while in Mexico before he goes where he goes. Then we begin to have a sense of these things happening everywhere. And let's, let's not forget that if anybody was Mr. Harlem Renaissance in DC, his name had to be Duke Ellington. There he is, born right there. In yes. Well, you know, the part of the place where the question was coming from, you know, in the jazz world amongst musicians, uh, there's always that great bass player in Kansas City who never left home. That's and right. that, you know, and that, you know, the, the guitar player in Texas, or like when I first came to New York 42 years ago, uh, someone told me, uh, no matter how good you think you are or your friends are, uh, they were talking specifically about the tenor sax, but it was every instrument. One night you'll be playing a jam session and somebody will come up from Brooklyn Mm -hmm. and just yeah. obliterate everybody. And then we would meet Howard Kimbo or we would hear these great musicians who, for whatever reason, uh, family reasons, professional reasons, just decided to either have a day gig or not have a day gig, but they were as good as anybody. So I'm just curious, uh, are there any major figures from the, from the 20s in, in, in what we think of as that renaissance? Uh, in other cities who just names like that, that, that we should know about, or frankly, was Harlem uh, the place where if you weren't there or somehow part of that, then it, uh, it didn't well, I, have, have an impact? To, to, I, I might start by answering that and answering that or approaching it by saying, I think the study of the geography of, this, of the Harlem Renaissance has yet to be fully undertaken. We don't know about the Harlem Renaissance fully in Pittsburgh or where we got Strayhorn and, and Billy Eckstein and and what's Kluke, uh, uh, the, the 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 great drummer uh, Kenny Clark. Kenny Clark. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, Earl Hines. Uh, 
and Ahmad Jamal. You know, it's, it, it, part of what we get there is people from the 20s, like Earl Hine before the 20s, mm -hmm. and people who came of age in the 20s and who began to hit in the 1950s, like Ahmad Jamal, or mm -hmm. the 30s, like like uh, like uh, uh, Eckstein, mm -hmm. or Mary Lou Williams uh, out of Atlanta, but then Pittsburgh is home. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that that's one place. Uh, but I, I think that to your point earlier, too, you were alluding to the fact that there is such a thing as a Harlem part of the Renaissance. The Har Harlem was a magnet. Uh, people thought of it as a cultural capital, as the Black Paris, as the place that everybody we have named had to go and, and to see uh, right. Black people doing all sorts of things. Right. And, and, uh, and I, I think it is very, very important that uh, somebody like Bearden could come up, Romar Bearden, the painter, could come up from North Carolina and Pittsburgh. But then when he gets to Harlem, he said he went to a meeting of, of a, somebody called a meeting in the 30s of Harlem artists, and he expected to be the only one there. And there was a whole room of people there. And, and he meets Jacob Lawrence, and he meets the, uh, uh, Aaron Douglas. And he begins to be aware that Harlem had drawn people mm -hmm. like himself to the great city. And it, 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 it certainly did stir things up and make you feel a sense that this was a cultural capital indeed and you had work to do to, to, to measure up to the standard. I'll tell you, I won't name the guy because he'd be embarrassed by it. I have a friend from Boston who said when he finally um, uh, got got his chops together, he came down to the, what was the name of the place at 154th off of Broadway? The um, St. Nick's? Saint Nick. He came down to St. Nick's Pub in, in, in the 1980s. And he said, and he, and he um, was all ready. And he had his tenor and uh, he was listening to young cats play and, and then some of the older ones. And he said he realized that he had to keep his horn right where it was in that in that case. And he wasn't ready for that. He had never heard that consistently high a level from people that were not yet recording or re doing anything. And I think that that, hap that was part of the excitement of coming to Harlem. You thought you were a writer, but then you met like, uh, Richard Wright. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, I love it. Uh, we've known each other so long and I've, I've learned so much and read so much and attended your classes and all that, that, you know, I was right in the same wavelength <laughs> as to where you took us there. Because uh, my question was what's going to be uh, is in the realm of fiction, where is the mise-en-scene of the Harlem Renaissance best captured? Uh, you know, so many people, uh, you know, have written uh, nonfiction about it. And there's, you know, Langston Hughes' autobiography, just for starters, and all these other things that sketch out the time. Uh, you know, in Wright, in Ellison, in Baldwin, uh, in others, or even people maybe even of a slightly earlier vintage. Uh, where do we look in fiction uh, for, a, for a portrait of that? that rings true, or actually, not that it rings true because it's fiction, but yeah, what's well, your take? I, uh, may I approach that question by saying in, in my Harlem Renaissance class, I, I give the students a syllabus, as you know, I, you know, I've shared that with you in preparation for our conversation here. But part of what the syllabus asks the students to do is to write a new syllabus and to tell me about the, 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 the Harlem Renaissance in boxing or the Harlem Renaissance in Los Angeles, or the Harlem Renaissance in San Francisco, mm. or as you're asking now, the Harlem Renaissance in fiction. And I'll say now, if you do it, you have to, you can't just say anybody that you know, you have to tell me why you've picked this time frame. And I would say, if I, if I were doing a Harlem Renaissance in fiction course, I probably would start with William Wells Brown, the former slave who, who writes an early a novel called Clotel, the, the, the president's daughter. It's one of the, it's an ironical treatment of, of slavery. Uh, it's it's an it's a furious book, but it has funny things about it. Lauren, at one point, uh, the the main character is, is who is a slave is at a card game uh, with uh, attending his master, uh, and the master begins to lose the cards, and the master tells the slave to get up on the table. He bets the boy, and loses him in a card game. And that kind of wild, uh, uh, absurd, cruel, and yet somehow funny yes. uh, business is something you can find in Wells Brown. I what year is that, Bob? Roughly, uh, I mean. That's gonna be uh, uh, 1880, uh, 
Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Early, early. And yeah. then uh, Frederick Douglass does some fiction. Charles Chestnut is our probably our first really great writer mm -hmm. of the 19th century. Um, uh, and uh, then I think we do go to James Weldon Johnson, who in 1912 writes a novel called The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. Now that's a novel, although he calls it an autobiography. And that's very, very influential. Nella Larson writes a pair of important novels, one called Passing, one called Quicksand. Uh, Hughes is writing short fiction and then his first novels as, as, as early as, as the late 20s into the 30s. And so we begin to have, have a tradition that, that's coming together. Hurston's first novel is the early 30s, um, uh, Jonas Gordbein and Their Eyes Were Watching God in 1937. Uh, and, and, and this is sort of crowned by, by, by Richard Wright's achievement of 1940 uh, 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 with uh, Native, Son. Native Son. But I think it's, it, it is interesting to think of those roots coming, co coming, coming consi consistently earlier. Another thing I like to do is put Toni Morrison's novel called Jazz in my Harlem Renaissance syllabus. Hmm. Her, not, her, her book is about the Harlem Renaissance and tries to ask, where does it all come from? There she is from Lorraine, Ohio, um, a student formerly of, 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 at Cornell and Howard University. And she looks back and she's drawing on all the novelists I've named, but it's also significant that she's also drawing on Marquez and Joyce and she's drawing on Faulkner. And, she, and, and once again, she's stepping out from any assigned mm -hmm. space, draw on any and everything that, that, that she can. Well, and, th and that helps create the context uh, for the question of, is there a novel outside of uh, uh, Morrison's jazz uh, that captures in fiction the mise-en-scene of of those people who wrote the books, <laughs> of the you know, uh, or did that really not happen? Uh, just uh... well, um, I, I might say that. Well, I think of, think about your question that there's there's a that August Wilson's cycle of plays in which he he goes decade by decade telling the story of Black America does very good. He has a extremely fine uh, sections on the 1910s and then. The, play about the 1920s and the 1930s mm -hmm. and that Joe Turner's come and gone and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and I can't think of the name of the third one those really cover that territory and yes. they ask where does the spirit where does this new energy come from and yeah. what is the new imperative of our age given all these political difficulties and, and other things like that um, there's a what's the name coming through slaughter is another one that the, uh, the the novel that encompasses Buddy Bolden's story by the novel uh, Ondante uh, uh, is is another person that's trying to account saying where does Buddy Bolden come from, where mm -hmm. does jazz come from, and yeah. I think that's another one that helps us understand the mil milieu, though it's a current book, relatively. Yeah. If you had been around in the twenties, knowing now what you know now, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, who do you think, I mean, you know, uh, who would, in the way that Ellison, you know, in the way that Langston Hughes might have been for Ellis, or was for Ellison, in other words, just a, a door opener or an introducer, uh, something like that. Uh, who do you think you would have liked to have been your, your mentor or okay. your, your opener into that world with all those folks whose whose works and lives you you know so well. I'm just curious, uh, where would you place yourself? Well, l l let, let me uh, think about that a moment while I go back to your, your to your earlier conversation about novels that tell the story. Invisible Man uh, is it, set in the 30s, but it really is asking what is the situation of somebody who comes up from a small town in the South, comes to New York and tries to make it as something, as, as a new Negro, as a new kind of person, in his case, as a speaker who's interested in politics. I think that's another book that, 
if we dig deeply into it, we get it. We get a sense of where this new uh, spirit comes from. Now, your other question about if I went back and knew now what I knew then, what I knew know now, I'm first of all reminded of a song that you may know by Sonny Boy Williamson, in which Sonny Boy said, uh, "In my younger days, I just I just wish I knowed then what I know now." <laughs> He said, he said, I'd have had a home if I, if I did that. It's a beautiful song. And I, I, I often have that fantasy of going back and collecting on some of the young ladies that I knew in high school that I just didn't know what to say to at that time. OK, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way it is. You have to wrap it up there. No, I, I tell you, I would like to have been there when teenage Johnny Hodges was being mentored by Sidney Bechet. And to think about that wide vibrato and that fantastic sense of the blues that was so inspiring to Duke Ellington, and to uh, to, to I, I don't know that I would I would have had to keep my horn in my case. You you and I know that I was an amateur saxophone player as a teenager and will be. I still have my horn back there somewhere. But I would like to have been there when Sydney was discovering that that an opera like the aria from Porgy and Bess called Summertime could be transposed into a blues dance. And when he was discovering that you could put in the middle of that an aria by Verdi, and that was all part of what was available to, to the new Negro that he was. And then to be there while little Johnny, while the, the, the baby rabbit was looking on, getting ready to change music in the way that he did as a member of Ellington's band. If I had to pick one moment and spend one day with somebody, it probably would be right there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but also, how about in the literary world and in, in the, that world that, well, that, you know, yes. well, the salons I, and all those people and all those things? You know, um, I guess I would pick an odd example there. I think that James Weldon Johnson was an exceedingly great person and a great example of what it meant to be a Harlem Renaissance leader. He was a poet who wrote uh, God's Trombones. He wrote the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Bo Voice and Sing. He's a, he was a musician who wrote for the stage, mm -hmm. uh, both comedy and tragedy. He wrote the important novel that I mentioned before, Ex Colored Man. He was multilingual. He was the first lawyer from a, a black lawyer in Florida. He was a, a leader of the NAACP. Uh, his history of black uh, Harlem called Black Manhattan is an exceptionally great book. Mm -hmm. And so if, if I would have a chance to go back and shake his hand and try to capture some of the spirit that let him know uh, that he could be all those things, I would be that. I'll tell you another thing. When I moved to Columbia, I had a chair already, thank goodness, from Barnard College, but I was recruited by Columbia across the street. And they said, well, we don't, we, we, we don't have a chair at the moment, but we'll invent one. What would you like chair to be called? And I said, well, if I'm gonna be sitting up here in Harlem, I would like my chair to be called the Zora Neale Hurston chair in literature. And what I meant by that was that I would like to catch again some of the spirit that let her know that she could be all the things that she became, scientist and social scientist and novelist. And so I, I guess if, if, if I could be there while she was uh, getting on the train uh, up from Florida or getting on the boat, getting ready to go down to, to Haiti and Jamaica uh, to, be, to be part of her expansive sense of who she was and what she could be. I'd love to be there too. Well, I look forward to uh, our subsequent conversations because we're going to have one focusing around uh, Zora Neale Hurston and one focusing around Langston Hughes. So the fifteen, well, not the many questions that just popped in my head to ask you about Zora Neale Hurston are going to have to wait. But uh, actually, Bob, I was always wondering how that chair got that name, and I, I was curious how it happened. I also wanted it to be a woman's name. I, I um, mm -hmm. uh, most 
most men wouldn't want to be called Zora Neale Hurston. I'd be proud as hell to be called Zora Neale Hurston. And that's what people introduce me as, the Zora Neale Hurston professor. And I don't think there are enough black women's names on chairs like that. They usually are named after donors, who, and understandably enough, but I, I wanted to, to, to take that name. Let me say one other thing concerning the, the overarching business of, of the Harlem Renaissance and what it means. When I was a graduate student, Ralph Ellison and Al Murray came to speak at Harvard. I was a student there. And Ellison said, the Harlem Renaissance was a sophisticated moment, a sophisticated moment when people realized that there would be a new sort of leadership, whether it came to the sciences or to gardening or to, to, to whatever it is that you were doing, to painting, to music, there would be something new. We didn't know what it was yet, but there, would, there was a sophisticated moment. And I love that because that way you, you hear it in the gospel music that changed, in the, in the, the spirit of Garveyites as they had their sense of an international project, people who were listening to the negritude movement women who said wait there's a new woman there's we want to be part of a new psychology a new science a new physics we want to be part of a sophisticated moment that's much bigger than than than, than just one neighborhood or one uh way of expressing yourself uh we, we want to become the jack johnson of whatever it is that we do well you've brought us to uh the conclusion of a wonderfully uh sophisticated moment here and a tremendously educational moment and thinking about Jack Johnson and Marcus Garvey and Zora Neale Hurston and all these folks and the, the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance largely writ uh, is something that uh, I really look forward to uh, exploring with you uh, in our next conversation. So, Bob, thank you so much. Oh, well, this the has been wonderful. Been yeah. a pleasure. Thank you.